let's keep this day rolling folks. The next talk is from Chris DeMars. Chris is a front end engineer with Tuft & Needle and he specializes in accessibility in all shapes and forms. In this talk, he's gonna be discussing how users with low vision use your applications and trying to draw out a few tips about how you can help them by making some subtle yet important improvements to your applications. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Future Sync. I'm super stoked to be speaking. Uh, before I get started, I do want to give a huge thank you to Future Sync for bringing me on for this event. And also a huge shout out and thank you to Amy Knight. If you don't follow Amy Knight on Twitter, you should. Uh, she's an amazing person, amazing developer. She's the one that put it uh, in the Future Sync ear that I was looking to speak, or I probably might make a good speaker. So, huge thank you to Amy. Huge thank you to Future Sync for bringing me out. And I also want to thank all the sponsors. If it wasn't for sponsors, we wouldn't have events. There would be no developer community. So if you do get a chance, I know this isn't an in-person event. I'm sure it would have been amazing if it was. But it's not because, you know, the times of the world right now. So if you do get a chance to, in some shape or fashion to, sh to thank your sponsors, please go ahead and do that. Also, this is the official hashtag for the event, FutureSync20. So if you're tweeting, doing all that cool, fun stuff, that the kids nowadays do. Uh, if you could throw a Future Sync 20 on that, that would be amazing. I also have it at the bottom of the, uh, the slides as well. And also this too, I love the developer community. So if you could throw a hashtag developer community on those tweets, that would be super, super appreciated. You're the reason why I do what I do. You're the reason I write and I speak and I do podcasts and I do all of these things for the community. I love each and every one of you. And uh, you know, let's let's keep the developer community strong we definitely need to have that right now more than ever so throw that on there if you're tweeting i usually start all my accessibility talks with this video right here uh, it's from apple i'm not sponsored i'm not endorsed i'm not getting paid by apple but i do want to show it off just to to get your gears moving and make you think a little bit about how it is out there in the real world people think that having a disability is a barrier But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. Three miles to the summit. You can concentrate on every word of a story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. Now there's a reason I show this, this video. We can make things all day that we think are cool, we think is sweet, colors, fonts, etc. But at the end of the day, the users are what matters. They matter out there. So I hope this can get your mind kind of kind of moving, get the gears turning a little bit to see that, you know, the world is bigger and the web is bigger than we are. Another cool thing I like to show off too, uh, this is a package from Marcy Sutton, a friend of mine. Uh, it's called No Mouse Days. So the way it works is that you can throw it into your, your code and then you can use it to see what it's like just to use a keyboard. So it's really, really cool to use that when you're doing auditing and testing and building out features, etc. So if you get a chance, uh, check that out. GitHub.com slash Marcy Sutton slash no dash mouse dash days. Why? I get this question a lot. Why do you care so much about accessibility, Chris? And the answer for me is easy. Uh, my mom is of the baby boomer generation. So she's getting, she's getting older. Her birthday's next month. 
But when I speak to her on the phone, you know, sometimes I have to talk really loud. So there's one type of disability. She has some hearing disabilities. She wears glasses. She has trouble seeing if she doesn't have her glasses on. I also have glasses on for the computer. Uh, so there's there's a, a visual impairment there. She shakes when she writes. She has nervous issues. So we have some, some mobility issues there. She also has arthritis. I can tell her that I'm speaking at this event this week. I could talk to her maybe 10 minutes from now. And she would ask what I'm doing this week. She would have no recollection that I told her that. But she can remember something from 1977 like that. So we have some cognitive disabilities going on. Knock on wood, she doesn't have any temporary impairments. Broken hand, broken, broken arm, anything like that, broken finger. But she has four out of the five types of disabilities or impairments that we're trying to target when we're building on the web. If I can make an accessible user experience for her at the end of the day, I have done my job as a worker on the web. And if you were wondering what your why was, I'm hoping that after this talk is over, you can go back and reflect. And maybe you'll figure out what your why is. Thanks for coming to the talk. I can't see low vision A11Y users. My name is Chris Mars. I'm a front-end developer. I work for a company called Tuft and Needle, a mattress company. We're based out of Phoenix, Arizona. I work remote. I used to have a couple slides on me as a person, so you know it's not like I'm just blowing smoke to tell you like I am a real person and these are the cool things I like and the cool things I'm into. I got some feedback one time. It was pretty much like Chris, we don't really care about you. We care about your talk, and that hit me in the feels pretty hard. But I got to thinking about it, and I was like, you know what? People need to understand that I'm actually a person. So I decided to throw that stuff back in. So a little bit more about me. I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies. I'm a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies. I'm an international speaker. I'm, a found, I'm the founder of Viewtroit, which is a Vue meetup back in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I currently live in Denver, Colorado, but I am moving back to Michigan in a couple months. Less, less than a couple months. Uh, I host a podcast called Tales from the Script, and I love tattoos and horror. So now you know a little bit more about me. All right, here's the podcast, Tales from the Script. Uh, you can check it out, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, all the cool, fun things, the website, uh, TFT Script or TalesFTScript.com. So give that a follow, give that a listen. How many have heard this before? And if you can't raise your hand, uh, by all means, you don't have to raise your hand. But if you've heard this before, you're probably thinking a lot of things. You know, I've heard it before. When somebody says, I can't see that, what do they mean? Do they mean because of color? Maybe there's some disabled features that they can't see. Maybe they have some type of low vision impairment that hinders them from actually observing what is on the screen. And if they do have some type of low vision impairment, what can we do as developers? What can we do as workers on the web to help them to have an amazing user experience? Believe it or not, according to the World Health Organization, all these other, other, other organizations that uh, take statistics and facts on, on people out there with disabilities, there are around 7 billion people around the world, give or take. 1.4 billion of them have some type of disability. So the 20% actually went up to about 35%, I believe, as of last year, the year before. That doesn't seem like a big number, but when you put that into whole numbers, 1.4, 1.5 billion people around the world have some type of disability. It's a big number. But, Chris, hey, you know what? I don't have anybody at work that has a disability. All our applications are internal. We don't have anybody with disabilities. And I always call BS on that. You have to internalize that. That part of your workforce, that percentage of your workforce has some type of disability, but they might not just come out right and tell you that, hey, I have some type of low vision impairment, or, hey, I can't hear in one ear. You have to internalize that percentage and make sure that the applications you're building in-house are also accessible. So if you've heard this term before, A11Y, you've probably heard it in the context of web and software. What this means is it's called a numeronym. It's when you take the first letter, the last letter, you count the letters in between, and you put them together. So the numeronym for accessibility would be A11Y or Ali or Ally. You've seen this out in the wild uh, with I18N for internationalization, L10N for localization. And if you work in the Kubernetes space, you've seen K8S. It stands for Kubernetes. That's a numeronym. It's just a shortened version of the word. So anytime you hear the term A11Y or Ali or Ally in the context of web and software, 
I would say 100% of the time, if they're not talking about being a male ally in tech, we or they are talking about accessibility. So what is Ally? What is A11Y? Well, according to the W3, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. But I have a big problem with this. And the reason I have a problem with this is because this is an open web. And an open web means an inclusive web. And an inclusive web means web for all. With that being said, this sounds better. Web accessibility means that everyone can use the web. Every single person on the internet or using the internet, regardless of ability or disability, should be able to have an amazing user experience. No questions asked. Everyone should be able to use the web. Here's another one from WebAIM. I really like this a lot. The web is not a barrier to people with disabilities. It is the solution. The key word being solution. It is our job as workers on the web, from design to stakeholder, to give a shit about accessibility. This is why we do what we do. I don't go to work for a paycheck. I work to make the web a better place. It is the solution that I am providing to my users. And this is something that you should be doing as well. Here's one for me. Accessibility is not a requirement. It is a must. You must care about accessibility. In my opinion, it's a moral obligation as a worker on the web. Because if you don't care, things like this happen. I love showing off this graph. Federal website, accessibility lawsuits by state in 2017. Total number of suits nationwide. And this is in the U.S., of course. A handful of states in Puerto Rico. 814 federal website lawsuits in one year. Just from those states in Puerto Rico. That's two and a half lawsuits a day. That is an unacceptable number, and we can't have it. So when you're thinking and you're building on, on accessibility, or if you need to take numbers or statistics to your, uh, to your stakeholder or to your business person, this is a perfect example right here. It can happen. It will happen. And you have to be cognizant of that. So when we talk about accessibility and users with disabilities, the first thing that comes to mind are users that are blind or users that are deaf. And that's, that's very, very short-sighted. Um, if I told you that users use Braille machines or sip and puff machines to, to help read or, or hear the output uh, with screen readers of a, of a monitor, you might be kind of puzzled, at least for Braille machines and sip and puff machines. But when we talk about these different types of abilities, we talk about hearing, so cognitive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, or a mixture of both of those. We talk about cognitive disabilities, math comprehension, reading comprehension, autism, I talk about mobility disabilities, arthritis, MS, cerebral palsy. We talk about temporary disabilities or temporary impairments, like broken hand, broken finger, you know, things like that. Uh, but the one thing we're going to talk about today is vision impairments, low vision impairments specifically. Here's a four-letter acronym that I want you to memorize. I want you to eat, sleep, breathe. We should all be using this as our, we're basing our development efforts around these four main guiding principles of accessibility, and they are as follows. Perceivable is the first one. Is the experience easily readable? Can I view the images? Can I use a screen reader? Operable, can I solely use just a keyboard? Are the interactions easy? Are there any timers on certain actions, like buying tickets to an event? Understandable, do I understand the language that's being presented? Are there supplemental representations for things I might not understand? And robust. Can the experience be viewed and used across a wide range of technologies out there? But out of those four letters, there's one that I want you to really, really, that one that really stands out, one that we're going to be talking about today, and that is perceivable. That's what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, one little thing to get out of the way, poor vision and low vision are not the same thing. Poor vision can be corrected by glasses or contacts. Low vision cannot be corrected by glasses or contacts. It's some type of eye disease or some type of degeneration within the eye. So let's talk about vision abilities and disabilities for a bit. Uh, users with full vision, uh, use of full use of their vision can make out things around them. Cultural, culturally speaking, they know the difference between streetlights, red, green, and amber. They can read text and view images. Uh, any of my horror fans out there, they'll, they'll know where the Raven is from, Edgar Allan Poe. They can make sense of symbolic and visual cues like this. And they can also perceive colors. 
Now, users with disabilities, on the other hand, they might not have that luxury. But there are other ways of communication for visually disabled users. One being audio format. And you usually get that by the screen reader of choice. So I came here and you came here and actually we didn't go anywhere. We're at our places of business or our homes, which is probably our place of business at this time, to talk about low vision and accessibility. So let's get into different types of low vision. The first one we're going to talk about is color blindness or color vision deficiency, CVD for short. Well, what is it? Great question. So according to the AOA, color vision is deficiency in the inability to distinguish, distinguish certain shades of color. Now, being colorblind doesn't, doesn't mean that you can't see every color in the color spectrum. It means there are certain colors that you might not be able to see or colors that represent other colors. doesn't mean that you just can't see any colors at all, right? So how many people are colorblind out in the real world? Well, for men, 1 in 12. 1 in 12 men are affected by some type of color blindness, some type of color vision deficiency. For women... There's one in 200. One in 200 women are affected by some type of color blindness. So if you look at the stats, 6% um, to 94%. The reason that more men experience color blindness is because the gene is passed down from the mom. Now, when I was doing my research a few years back, when I was building this talk and, and writing it and iterating over it, uh, I found out that this is true. The gene is passed down from the mom. And specifically in the UK, according to the study, the population of the UK was more male than female. Therefore, the population of the UK had more color vision deficiency, population of people with color vision deficiencies, than, than other countries out there because there's more men. All statistic, all came from a study I was reading about. So, yeah, I don't experience color vision deficiency, but if I did, uh, this is what I have to say. Thanks, Mom. I appreciate it. So what types of color vision, uh, color vision deficiencies do people experience? Well, if you had normal vision, this is kind of how your vision would look. We have deuteranopia, which is the reduced sensitivity to green light and is the most common type of color vision deficiency out there. We have protonopia, which is a reduced sensitivity to red light. And last but technically not least, we have tritonopia, which is a reduced sensitivity to blue light, and it is extremely rare. But there is one very last type of color vision deficiency that we have out there. And yes, you might have guessed it, monochromatic. There is such thing as a monochromatic color vision deficiency where people see in shades of gray. It is the rarest type of color vision deficiency. One in 33,000 people around the world have this type of color vision deficiency called monochromatic. So we have another type of low vision disability. It's called visual acuity. Now, when I say the words visual acuity, what comes to mind? Now, I'm thinking pop culture. I'm thinking movies. I hope I'm not the only nerd uh, watching or giving this talk. So I'll give you five seconds if you can just yell it out loud, even though I won't hear you. But who knows? Visual acuity. Jurassic Park. The T-Rex's visual acuity is based on movement. He'll lose you. He won't see you if you don't move. Now, we're not talking about this type of visual acuity. I just thought it was funny. This type of visual acuity is based on movement. What we're talking about is not based on movement. But we all know what happens when you move in front of a T-Rex. You end up like Gennaro. We don't want that. It's a shitty situation. No pun intended. So what is it? Well, visual acuity. That's another great question of what it is. If you've seen this chart before, you know that this is a visual acuity chart. This is a visual acuity distance chart, or it's called a Snellen chart. And it's used to determine the clarity of your vision at 20 feet. Now, if you thought you had 20-20 vision, because you can see 20-20, but you have other parts of your vision that aren't great, technically they say you don't have 20-20 vision. I always thought I had 20-20 vision, but I'm starting to to have vision issues and stuff like that, so I no longer have 20-20 vision. There are other things that make up 20-20 perfect vision other than being able to see this at 20 feet. So what types of visual acuity are recognized out in the wild today? Well, we have three different types of visual acuity. 
Now, I should have said this before. I am not an optom optometrist, an ophthalmologist. I am a web developer that loves speaking and speaking about accessibility. So bear with me. We have spatial acuity. And what spatial acuity is, it's the ability to resolve two points in space. So like A to B, right? Being able to see things from, from here to there. We have temporal acuity. That's the ability to distinguish visual elements in time. Perfect example of this is TV, movies, video games, etc. So a little fun fact, since I am a horror nerd, I love horror movies, and I use Nosferatu as the, the background of this slide. Uh, in the days of early motion pictures, way before any of us were around, black and white, you know, uh, silent pictures, there was a flicker in the, the film. Well, the reason that happened was because the, the motion of the film and how fast it was going and for our bodies and our minds and our brain and our eyes to keep up with that, uh, it, it didn't work quite well. We just, one thing couldn't keep up with the other, so there would be flicks in the film. And that's how movies became known as flicks. I know, right? Super cool little tidbit of information. We have spectral acuity. Now, spectral acuity is the ability to distinguish wave different differences in wavelengths, like types of light. An example of this are photographers who work in a dark room. When they have the red light, they can see crisp photos and text. Same thing with movie theaters. You'll see in movie theaters that there's, you know, usually going down the stairs is red light, like a strip of red light. So it's you you can see better when you're when you're leaving or when you're walking in and out of the movie theater during during a show. The same thing with with submarines. Submarines use red light when they're trying to navigate through through the corridor so they don't hit something or trip or fall. Really, really cool stuff. So acuity is science. And I could definitely go down a rabbit hole with the explanation of acuity. Uh, but I couldn't tell you the difference between a rod and a cone in your eye and how they absorb light and turn that light into images. Turn those images to pictures that your brain can process. So let's move on. We have contrast sensitivity. This is another one. This is very, very important. So when we talk about contrast sensitivity, we're talking about a person being able to distinguish something in the foreground compared to what it is on the background. So like the, the slides, for instance, the black text on the green background, that is color contrast sensitivity. I did check the colors of this. They do pass, even if you switch them. So we're, we're good to go. What is good color contrast, though? What makes for a good color contrast? Well, in general, it's any color that can bounce off of the background as a foreground color. Like I was saying, my slides, even if this was white on black or black on white, it bounces. You can clearly see the, the text. Easily discernible, easily able to be read. So according to the, uh, the new W3C uh, 2.1 specs, the minimal contrast ratio to meet level AA is 4.5 to 1. Now there's three different levels. There's A, AA, and AAA. You should automatically always hit A. AA is what you should strive for. AAA is really, really hard. You might not ever hit AAA as far as the whole application goes. Now if you had to look at this, we got some green in here, we got some white, some gray. Would this pass? The answer is no. This is not going to pass color contrast guidelines. If you bump the font up a bunch, it will. Because the bigger the font, even though if the color is light, the bigger the font, the more easily readable that text is. Now what about this one? We got 9.91 uh, to 1, 19.56 to 1, all black. We got lime green, yellow, white. This is how we used to build websites back in 96. This was like the color scheme we use and purple. Will this pass or fail? It passes because that color contrast is so high up. Now, this might not be a great user experience for someone. It still might be inaccessible to somebody. But according to the contrast ratio guidelines, it does pass. So now that we talked about a couple different types of low vision, and there are a bunch of them out there. I only covered a few. Uh, we can focus on the problem or the problems, and we have a few of them. Contrasting colors is a big one. All too many times we're using the wrong colors. They might look cool, but functionally they don't work. Like this, for instance. This is a navigation. Light gray, small text on a white background. As you can see, it fails AA and it fails AAA. Now, if the, like I was saying earlier, if you bump the font size up, it could pass. Well, that's true in this case. 
If you were to bump the font size to a, a bigger font size, it'll pass. <clears throat> excuse me, it will pass double A. But all in all, this is a bad, bad experience, and it, and it won't, will not pass. Uh, communication through colors is another big problem. We as developers and designers, product owners, stakeholders, anybody that is working on the web or has a piece of the pie for the web has to keep this into consideration. We cannot communicate through the use of color. Doing this poses a huge problem. If you're going to use color, make sure you have some type of verbalization associated with that. Some type of other visual distinction, normally text, that goes along with it. Let's say we have this awesome legend, right? We have red, green, blue, yellow, purple, and that's what this stuff means. Waiting, pushed, in progress, denied, passed. Okay, that's sweet. So let's say we have a user that is has some type of color vision deficiency, specifically monochromatic, and their boss says, hey, move that to pushed. Move that to red. I'm so, oh, well, I don't, I don't remember what that color was. They might not be able to see it. They might have never seen red before in their life. This is why we cannot communicate through the use of color. Disabling zoom, that's another huge one. Do not do this. If the user can't see small text on a device, you're doing them a disservice. If the user can't see a picture or a painting, you're doing them a disservice. Do not hijack the zoom. Poor line height, this is another one. If you have really, really poor line height, words and letters might get pushed together, might merge together, and your user might not be able to read the content that you're trying to portray. Poor typography. This is another one. Do not do not use poor typography in your experiences. There is some typography that you can use for, you know, your users that are dyslexic, Comic Sans being one. Comic Sans is great for dyslexic users. Uh, any italicized font is great for dyslexic users. But keep these things in mind when you're building. Maybe you can build in some type of simulator that can change the, the font on the screen. We have conflicting typography. Don't start mixing and matching a bunch of you know, different types of typography, papyrus and, and open sands with Montserrat and Poppins and all these different types of things. Just choose a couple and stick with those. Now we have ways of fixing these things. We have solutions to make sure that we do not fall down the accessibility trap. Right? Choose readable typography. Choose something that universally kind of works all around the board. And for those use cases, of where you would need you know, to target dyslexic users, keep that in mind. You don't have to build separate experiences for everybody. Build one experience for everyone. Use icons and symbols that make sense, maybe universally or maybe within your expertise or maybe within your domain, but try and find those types of icons and symbols that make sense all across the board when you're trying to build out these experiences. Enable Zoom by default. Do not hijack the user's Zoom. Make sure that they have a way to pinch in and Zoom, especially on a mobile device, so they can read and they can see and enjoy that experience that you're presenting to them. Now, we do have some tools out there, some tools I really, I really love. I use them all the time. We have AxeCore from DQ. DQ, uh, not Dairy Queen, is an accessibility company based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, this is a tool that you can use. Uh, in your browser, so they have browser extensions for Xcore and Firefox and in Chrome. You can use it in your end-to-end -end testing suites. Uh, you can use it in Selenium, Cypress, so that you can run an accessibility audit on your experience and see where you're at. Uh, this is using Xcoconut, their beta version. I don't suggest using this. Just use Xcore. If you go, if you Google, you know, X Chrome extension or Fire X Firefox extension. You'll be able to find them for your, your browser. But the way this works is that you can go into your dev tools and you can run X. You can run it on the web page. And it'll give you a list of violations and what the error is, how many errors you have. It can highlight in the UI where the error is. You can inspect the node. It'll pull up the dev tools. And it'll also tell you different ways you can fix the problem as well. Really, really great tool if you're doing audits and you're checking out and you're testing accessibility for your own experiences. Another one that I use side by side with Axe Core or Axe in the browser is Lighthouse. Lighthouse is in the DevTools as well. You can run all these different types of audits. One being an accessibility audit. It uses Axe Core under the hood. It gives you a score out of 100. So I know people say, you know, don't worry so much about your Lighthouse score. 
But the higher the Lighthouse score, the better. The more closer to the green you're going to get, the better. These tools are only going to catch between 20 to 55 to 50 percent of all accessibility errors. The only way you're going to get everything is through manual testing. So run these, check them all out. That, that's going to be great, but do manual testing as well. Use a screen reader. Just use the keyboard alone. These are things that are going to help you in your, your accessibility at your company. So I have some takeaways for you before I end. Uh, use colors that work. Try to use colors that work and get with your design team or your marketing team to figure out what those colors are and maybe tweak those colors. Run websites through a testing and audit tool like AxCore or use Lighthouse. Choose proper typography. You know, don't start mixing things and, and using all these different types of uh, different web fonts, stuff like that. Choose just a couple and stick with them. Uh, use a plugin for your editor. You know, you can use, you know, there's there's accessibility tools out there that you can use in your editor for linting, etc. And then leave Zoom alone. Do not hijack the Zoom, please. Uh, this is a quote I want to leave you with uh, from Marcy. Marcy used to work at DQ. Now she works at Gatsby. Every little bit of accessibility you contribute is so appreciated and so needed. Uh, resources and credits can be found here. They're all in a gist because there's way too many to put on a bunch of slides. That's my time. Thank you so much. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at Salt and Burnham. So if you're tweeting, doing all that, uh, hopefully you saw that the, the corner of the slides. So thank you so much.